Welcome to our tiny house build series, episode 10. At this stage, we have already finished framing, sheeting, and fiber glassing the roof of the house. And in this video, we'll show you step by step how we use paint to waterproof the siding of the house. Now you may wonder why we use paint to get it waterproof because it's just plywood. How we use paint to get plywood waterproof. Uh, we have done lots of research looking into it and we also see lots of examples of outdoor wooden structure to use paint to get it waterproof. Another reason why we choose oil-based paint to waterproof the side of the house is because we mass out the height and also the width of the tiny house so we can't put siding on the side of the house we have to be creative and use something that is very small profile so we choose to use paint and uh, plus you gotta be creative with your design and we can choose our own color and another advantage of using oil-based paint is you can always do a little touch up from time to time and it's very easy to check on spots that is damaged or need a little bit of fixing so it's really convenient for us and we will let you guys know down the road how the paint is holding up and but today's video will show you how we do it Now comes the most exciting part of painting the side of the house. It's the color that we choose. We had such a difficult time deciding the color that we both like and then also choose the pattern that we agree on for the side of the house. And finally we come down to the color seafoam green and a soft yellow color. Uh, we custom order those oil-based paint color from Dula's paint store. The name of the colors is called Chatty Cricket and uh, Banana Pudding. All right, guys, I also want to tell you a little bit about how difficult it was to actually get the paint that we wanted and the amount that we wanted. So this is an example of the uh, Chatty, or sorry, Banana Pudding paint that we got. And the store that I normally buy this metal paint from, the guys there are super nice and really helpful to me. But they were saying that they actually probably wouldn't be able to get us the amount of paint that we required. So I was going back and forth with them and letting them know that, you know, we could really use it, but what is the issue? And they were saying that due to the Texas power outages that resulted in all that freezing and damage to the power grid in Texas and to property and homes in Texas, actually shut down the plant that makes this type of oil-based metal paint. And I don't know if you guys have ever tried to find oil-based paint in Canada, but it is quite hard to find, and you can pretty much exclusively find it as metal paint. And this place will mix you custom colors of metal paint, which is really what we wanted. So what they ended up having to do is that we needed a gallon, approximately, of each color I calculated. So they were saying that they were especially short on white, and so what they ended up doing for, for us was that they just mixed us four quarts, because they had quarts of white. So they mixed us four little cans to make the banana pudding and then one big pan for the cricket color, the chatty cricket color, which was a lot easier for them to get. But as a result, for the entire paint job, we were extremely short of both colors of paint with no opportunity of being, potentially of being able to get more for, could be months until that plant comes back online, let alone when Dulux paint gets a new shipment of this stuff in. Mm -hmm. So that was a really big challenge. We really had to economize the paint and as a result, due to time and paint constraints, we mostly have one coat on everything. It is a thick coat, but we didn't quite have the time and wiggle room to do two coats. Yeah. Hopefully it's durable enough. Yeah, because of the limited paints, we cannot make any mistake yeah. when we spray paint things. And you can see there are some white strips on the side of the house. That's where we left for the window. We don't even have the room to spray paint the window because that's the session is going to cut out because we want to preserve as much paint as we can. Okay. We also used a wood primer from Sherwin-Williams. They have an oil-based wood primer product that is specifically designed for wood, obviously. 
and we did some actual testing on some little pieces a little boards of wood of testing different combinations of what would work and what we found is that by using the thinned metal paint as we would be spraying it that it just soaked into the wood fibers and so it would take in my opinion minimum two or three coats in order to make it look acceptable and we did not have that amount of paint however we had an unlimited supply of this sherwin williams primer because we it's a stock color and so we can get more and so we gave a full coat everywhere uh, a bit lighter than it should have been in some spots but we gave a full sealer primer coat to the entire house and so that meant that when the actual paint went on that it wasn't just bleeding into the wood and it was giving us that filled up gloss look that we wanted when you're using an oil-based paint you should note you do have to use an oil-based primer it's not the case the other way around but in that particular case you need an oil-based primer if you're going to use an oil-based paint just keep that in mind as well So guys, what is the difference between oil-based paint and water-based paint? And, and similarly, why did we use oil-based paint? Most chemicals are either oil-loving or water-loving. They're either lipophilic or lipophobic. So what that means is that they, the two won't mix very well. And so you have paints that are basically oil-based or kind of like fat-based or water-based. And they have some very, very big differences. They both have their advantages and disadvantages. But what I'm noticing is that here in Canada, at least, oil-based paints are largely disappearing, I think, for environmental reasons, quote unquote. And so we really had to look around to get oil-based paints. Mostly where we were able to find them was as metal paints. But back to the original topic, why use an oil-based paints? Oil-based paints are typically much stronger, much more durable, they're going to last a lot longer than water-based paints. A lot of the articles that I'd read were talking about how water-based paints have improved a lot over the last few years. But I think the reality is, is that water-based paints are still not as strong as oil-based paints. All right guys, so why did we use an oil-based paint? Truth be told, it was a more expensive solution and a more complicated solution. But oil-based paints have some really tantalizing advantages Aside from my experience with them, they're typically much stronger, they last much longer, especially in an outdoor application, and also their appearance and feeling is really, really different. You can totally use a water-based paint that you just roll on onto your house, and it's probably going to work as long as it's outdoor rated, but the end result you're going to get versus what we did is going to be night and day in my opinion. Water-based paints typically I would say have a more satin or matte finish and I wanted a high strength, high gloss finish. Some people will think of that as for appearance but high gloss also means it's going to make the house easier to clean and keep clean because stuff doesn't stick to it very well. Oil based paints come with some really large disadvantages as well. For one thing, you can't wash off your paintbrush or your paint gun just using water. You need to use a, a solvent that will dissolve the oil base paint. We principally used acetone and spray gun remover for those applications. Oil-based paint is also typically more expensive. The can of paint doesn't have that large of a difference, I would say, between outdoor water paint and the oil-based metal paints that we used. But 
The biggest difference was that you also have to buy the solvent, the acetone. We also used an isocyanate hardener mixed with the paint, which a little bottle of hardener for a gallon of paint costs as much as the paint. The end result though, after years and years and years of being outdoors will be very evident. The hardener really increases the durability of the paint. When most people heard that we were gonna use paint to waterproof our walls and to protect the wood, a lot of people were very surprised, but there's a really big difference between the type of like indoor roll-on paint that you can get versus what we did of spraying an oil-based paint with an isocyanate hardener and acetone. The difference in durability is very clear and you guys might not really be able to see it on the camera, but in person you can tell that this paint is very, very strong and will withstand years and years and years of weathering. Now for the truck, it was in its original fire truck green and a lot of people really loved that but I thought that it wouldn't fit very well with what we were going for for the house and it would be too obviously a fire truck which might arouse some suspicions if we're driving around on the street. So we ended up choosing a stock Rust-Oleum color gloss green for the cab and we chose another stock color which is gloss white for the front um, bumper. Pump, pump bumper, yeah, it's yeah. designed for a pump on it. And however, using stock colors, because we want kind of a, a unique look, we don't want it to look like something everyone else has. We chose custom colors for the house, obviously, but for the stock colors, we wanted to make it a little bit different, make it a little, pop a little bit more and make the truck visually a little bit more distinct from the house. So we ended up using some metal flake that I bought on Amazon for a different project before. It was very, uh, I've never used metal flake, but what I've heard is that you have to use it as part of a two-stage system with a clear coat. So we just really took a leap of faith and tried a single stage metallic uh, paint job using this Rust-Oleum and the metal flake added in at the quantity they recommended. And to be honest, it turned out really good. Uh, I, I really like it. It would look better with a clear coat to make the, the shininess more deep inside the paint. But as it stands, I'm really impressed that we managed to get a decent result at all with that. And it was really just to help make the truck look like less of a stock color and make it look more unique which it really does, mm -hmm. it really does. yeah all right hey guys i just finished painting the cab and other dark green elements of the tiny house right here the truck element of it at least and it was quite an interesting process it's my first use ever of a metallic system which i kind of came up with myself but today we wanted to show you kind of some of the gear that we're using to do the painting on the tiny house so we used all oil paints which are much more durable than water-based latex paints. We used hardeners. Overall, it was an expensive system that probably cost total about $100 per gallon, to be honest with you, which is expensive for paint. But it prevents us from having to buy siding and having to have the associated width that that would come with. All of the painting that we've done on this house so far 
has been using a process and a set of tools called HVLP. What does HVLP mean? That is high volume, low pressure. So let's show you some of the gear that we use. All right guys, right here is an HVLP spray gun. I have it put a, taken apart because we were just cleaning it. I didn't do an extremely thorough job of cleaning it, mainly just cleaning the paint of the inside. Looks like it was dipped in paint actually at the front here. But this is how it looks like and it usually has its paint cup up here. And you guys have probably seen these in some video or something. Usually people like custom spraying cars are using something like this. So why use an HVLP spray gun? It has its own upsides and downsides, but the main reason to my view is that the result that you'll get in terms of painting is far better. Mainly three technologies for putting paint onto something. There is brushing, which leaves brush strokes usually. There's rolling, which doesn't leave big unsightly brush strokes, but leaves kind of a thatch pattern that looks good with matte or semi-gloss paints. But we're using a gloss high strength paint, and so spraying leaves you with no evidence that you sprayed it at all if you do it properly. There's other issues you can run into like orange peel but generally speaking if you do a smooth job you have no absolutely no brush marks and no evidence that there was anything that painted it it kind of looks like magic and the HVLP part of it like I say is high volume low pressure so most air compressors will output air at about 100 psi at a maximum of about 4 CFM is pretty much all I can find consumer level which is cubic feet per minute so the pressure, the PSI, that's how much force the air comes out with, and the CFM is how much volume of air, how much area, space of air it can move. Now these things, they require a lot of air, but not at a high pressure. They use maybe 30 to 50 PSI, most of these spray guns, rather than 100. So you need to regulate the pressure of your compressor down in order to do that. But the volume is the real issue because most of these take 10 CFM in order to properly atomize the paint and turn it into a mist. You want that high volume, low pressure because with too much pressure, it sprays back and you lose a lot of paint. You need a lot of volume to push it out, but you want it at a low pressure. Now this is pretty inconsistent with a lot of compressors. So we're gonna show you the very unique setup that we used in order to make this happen. So guys, I have done HVLP paint spraying before with some pretty simple gear, but it has often been quite difficult and taken a long time and had improper atomization and a lot of paint wasting. And the reason was, as I've come to find out, is that any compressor that I've been able to find at a consumer level in Canada, even thousand dollar compressors can only seem to output about four CFM and you need double that in order to have an, use an HVLP spray gun. So what I found, for example, is that you have the compressor here and then the tanks. So you can get good atomization for like 10 seconds and then the tanks run out and then the spraying bogs down and suddenly you're spraying barely any paint out once the compressor is actually just pushing you along. It doesn't hardly matter what pressure you're using even, it just isn't moving enough air. It isn't moving enough air and so you slow down your painting uh, and when you slow down your painting, you're there all day and you, and you know, you wait for the compressor to pull its tanks back up. That's like 30 seconds that you're waiting for your, for your air compressor to get you back to where you need to be. So given the size of this job, very quickly we realized we'd have to do something very radical. And so what I came up with, you guys will be confused. What the hell are all these things? Well, I have several compressors. This is my dad's old compressor and this new one that we bought in order to have a smaller unit to do air nailing and stuff. And so we just have them teed together. So what this is currently is that this is a line heading to the other compressor in the garage, which itself can provide about four CFM at, you know, 120 PSI. It's regulated down to um, 60, about, so about 60 static. It'll probably drop down to like 40 while running. And then we have this one hooked up to the other end of the T. This is the garage compressor right here. This is of course the compressor we're seeing right here. They're regulated to approximately the same pressure. And then this is my output line, which heads to the gun. It's a, I was using a small curly whip line, but that one wasn't moving enough air because it was quarter inch and this is three eighths. This one seems to move air a bit better. So it took a little bit of fine tuning, but what you really want when you have something like this is that you have them both regulated or you can have a regulator right by your HVLP spray gun. And what you really want is that the tanks can handle you once again for, you know, 10 seconds, 20 seconds, maybe, especially because now I have much more capacity in the system. But what you want to have it is so that 
as you use up your air supply that you hear one compressor kick on and then you hear the other compressor kick on after another few seconds because if just one compressor is the only one kicking on, you're going to get to that point where you've run out of air capacity in your tanks and you're breaking into that 4 CFM pump again. Now, similar to electronics, I really suspect, I really believe that if you're getting both of the compressors pushing air through at the same time, you're going to get probably, maybe not quite 10 CFM, but you're going to get a lot higher than 4 for sure. But, which is really what you're getting as these things are running. Especially as they get hot, they're probably really starting to bog down. So having the two of them together gets your air volume up, air flow up, and it's actually a lot less difficult than some people said. Now, if you, have, if you don't have two compressors, you might see if you can find for HVLP spraying an actual compressor that will do 10 CFM, but I'm sure it would be expensive, hard to find, and I happen to have the two compressors. And all I had to do was just come up with this T arrangement using some store-bought pieces. Now is the most exciting part. Right now, we're finally going to take the masking paper off and reveal our paint job. I am nervous and also very excited. I cannot wait to see the new look of the house. Let's do it! All right, it has been a few days since paint and I'm gonna give you guys a closer look at what we did here. Here at the front of the truck, we repainted its bumper. We left the grill, however. We removed a lot of stuff that we didn't need. And you can see the truck's front end here, looking quite vintage. So guys, why are there certain sections that are not painted at all? There's this one and these ones over here. Well, we were so low on paint that we approximately defined where all windows and doors were gonna be and we just did not paint them in order to conserve material. We also didn't do as much surface prep in these areas. After doing the primer, we found that the wood had been out in the weather so much that it was starting to kind of peel and crackle. And after we did the primer, it really, really enunciated how many little flecks of wood fibers and stuff were coming out. So we ended up sanding the entire house at 220 grit to really smooth it out. 
and then after the paint went on, it was just beautiful. But here's an example of the texture of the house before it was sanded, whereas this is in the door area, whereas if you come over here, it gets extremely smooth, like buttery smooth, and it's really quite nice. At the very top of the house, you can see the fiberglass coming down in some points. We did not prime that, we just scuffed it up to accept the paint. During our testing, we found that the fiberglass did not soak in any paint, obviously, because it's not porous. Why it's so good against water? In terms of paint layout design, what I was trying to create was a separation between the house and the truck. Given that they're actually built so intertwined with each other, I thought it would be very nice to actually visually split them up a little bit. By using a darker color and different color texture with the glitter, versus the house which has a lot of pastel soft tones that are gloss but not metallic, it creates a bit of a visual separation between the house and the truck, though they are joined so intertwined. It creates kind of a different look. We also ended up using a different white tone on the house versus the truck. Despite the part of, partly this is due to the limited banana pudding color we had, but it also helps to reinforce that slight separation between the house and the truck. house and you already see how our painting process goes and how the end result looks like. In the next video, we will show you how we put our DIY triple paint windows and the door in. That will be a totally different look. I can't wait to see it. See you guys next time.